What does it mean, keeping a project nice and clean? Uh, well, uh, first things first. Ah, sorry. Uh, you already saw Zen of Python today at the keynote, uh, the keynote talk. Uh, this is a collection of some Zen quants uh, that uh, describe the ph general philosophy of Python. And I picked up a, just a few lines from it that uh, are related to uh, my talk. So, beautiful is better than ugly. Having nice and tidy code means it is beautiful to look upon. Also, readability counts. I have to emphasize on this, this is really important, and I will come back to it later. And there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do things. So, why should you care? Ah, sorry, sorry, wait. Why should you care whether your code is readable, consistent, and other things? Readability counts. Uh, before I started working in Python, I uh, did my fair share of programming in Perl. I don't know whether any of you ever programmed in Perl, but it's very easy to write incomprehensible code. You can write tidy and nice code in Perl, but it's not that easy, and it, it not as easy as Python. But also, as I mentored uh, junior programmers, I learned that you can also write incomprehensible code in Python. It's not that hard. <laughs> right. It makes cooperation easier. Uh, if you have consistent style throughout your code base, throughout many projects, and you have a team that works on all of these projects, then being consistent uh, will help cooperation a lot because when you have different projects uh, with different style, you will have to adapt to style of each project. And if you switch uh, fast between individual projects, it can be quite demanding. Also, it can help avoid bugs and vulnerabilities. Uh, this is uh, mostly regarding clinters that I will get to during my talk. And also, it can save time if done right. First thing first, what tools can we use to make our project look nice and clean? Look at these two examples of an init functions. They are functionally identical. Uh, one is uh, aligned by the open end bracket, the other is aligned uh, like this. So which one looks better? Who thinks the first one looks better? Right, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which, <laughs> who thinks the second one looks better? Okay, great, lots, lots of hands. Who doesn't care? Thank you, okay. Because whatever your answer, we can argue about that in the pull request. <laughs> I've seen my share of pull requests where uh, people argued about which alignment is better, which code style is better. And uh, I think this is a waste of time. You shouldn't waste time arguing about the specific style. Here comes the auto formatters. So, keeping consistent formatting is a manual task. And manual tasks should be automated. Well, there comes our heroes. Black, the, well, not the original auto formatter, but the original auto formatter that got really popular. Uh, it, I think it's like seven years old, and it came. And it, uh, what it did is it took your code, uh, parsed it into abstract syntax tree, and it outputted it in another way, way that was pleasant to look upon, and it is for easily readable. Uh, yeah, great revolution. What is great about this is that uh, you don't actually need to uh, think about formatting anymore. Because when you don't use auto formatter, you still do some kind of formatting, but you do it manually. And you have to spend time, uh, spend portion of your cognitive function thinking about this. So even when, when I didn't use auto formatter, I had to write, and uh, I already formatted the code during writing the code. That took some part of my cognitive abilities. And uh, then when I finished, I had to go through it again and reformat it <laughs> even more. But when you have an auto formatter, you can write your code any way you like. It can be really dirty and then you just, uh, in the best case, you just map auto formatter to save in your editor and 
you have nicely formatted code after each save that's really uh, readable, really comprehensible. Uh, Raf is much younger brother of Black. Uh, and it actually does a lot more than auto formatting. I will get to it later. But uh, it's only like one and a half year, two years old, and it's still evolving rapidly. But as far as auto formatting goes, uh, it's on par with Black. Uh, the code they produce is almost the same. There are some differences that are explained in the rough documentation. Like, this is where we chose to diverge from Black, and this is why but I don't think any of these decisions are really significant. Uh, there's also YAP. I made it in italics because I didn't use it, uh, unlike Black and Truff. Uh, it's made by Google. Uh, it's also an R formatter, and it's uh, configurable, much more than Black and Truff, which have only a few buttons you can turn. And that leads to my <laughs> another point. Less options are less to argue about. So. What I would recommend is just pick an auto formatter and stick with it. Just use the default. If you have very strong opinions in your team, sure, turn the knobs. But if you don't, don't, don't argue about them. It's a waste of time. Uh, the main difference between Black and Rough is that Black is written purely in Python. Rough is written in Rust. So it's fast, as everyone who writes anything in Rust tells you. Uh, but it's only significant in big projects, so it's up to you. Linters. Linters are small programs that uh, go through your code and make uh, suggestions about how you might improve it. They can detect bugs, they can detect password leaks, typos, bad practices, and other things. They also shorten feedback loop. If you have them integrated into your IDE or into your editor, you immediately see as you write the code that there's something fishy about some parts of it and you can react to that. And it's much better if your editor tells you, maybe you should uh, improve this, than if you write the code, send it to the reviewer and the reviewer says, okay, I don't like this bit, can you please work it? And it then it best view, you have to work on it again. So it shortens this feedback loop. There are tons of these tools, okay. So there's Flake, Flake 8, which is actually integration of several other tools like uh, PyFlakes and PyCode Style and uh, others. Uh, and they make a general suggestions about code, how it should be formatted and such. There's eSort, which takes care of sorting your imports and organizing them into neat groups. There's PyDoc style, uh, which takes care about uh, formatting your doc strings. Uh, there are two widely accepted doc strings conventions, NumPy and uh, Google. And PyDoc style can check both of these uh, conventions and uh, tell you that anything's wrong. Bandit is really interesting because it uh, looks for security flaws or potential potential security problems. There's also PyUpgrade, which is a bit different because it helps you migrate your code to the newer Python standard. Because when you write your code, you probably support only some subsection of Python versions. And uh, as old Python versions go uh, uh, to the end of life, you want to upgrade and keep your uh, code current. So PyUpgrade uh, introduces new, uh, new Python features into your code. And there's a doc8 that's a bit different because it cares about uh, formatting of uh, uh, restructured text, which is the main documentation format for Python. Just a few examples. Manit, if you, if you have a code and you call YAML load, well, then if you run bandit on this code, it will say you, it's not safe to call uh, YAML load because it can cause uh, instation of arbitrary objects. This means you can, for example, create infinitely deep recurse structures and uh, that can lead to denial of service attack or something like that. So use YAML safe load. It even gives you a suggestion what you, su what you should do. It's great. Uh, another example, like some bugbear, you have a string I hope every, everyone sees this, and uh, you call strip.txt on it, and that should strip the 
the string dot txt from the end of the string, right? Although it doesn't, because if you give multiple characters to strip, it actually strips all the all sequence sequences composed of these characters from end and beginning of the uh, of the string. So text txt strip dot txt would become e. Uh, there is remove suffix function for this, but it only came in Python 3.9, so um, you can still bump into this, especially in our code. And there's like a bug bear that tells you, yeah, it's not a good I, I are you really sure you want to use strip with multi-character strings? If you are, you can tell it with simple comment, yes, I am sure this is what I intend to do. So it doesn't forbid you to do it. It just uh, tells you, are you really sure? Okay. And there's one linter I didn't talk about yet, and it's rough. Okay, I already mentioned rough as an outer formatter, but rough actually uh, started as a linter. And it took all these great tools that we already have, and it, uh, it took rules that these tools enforce and integrated them into itself. So now Ruff implements around 800 uh, rules, and it integrates all of these except for the doc eight because it doesn't care about restructured text. But all that concerns Python code, Ruff, Ruff can already do. And it's very fast because it's in Ruff, uh, because it's in Rust. So, is there any reason why sh you should not use Ruff? There may be, because you still can have very specific needs and you need to write your own plugin. And uh, as of now, Ruff doesn't support writing plugins. Flake does. But other than that, uh, I would argue that using Ruff is simpler at the time because you only have one tool. There's also one more advantage to it, and that's Autofix is just great. So autoformatter is great because you don't have to spend your cognitive uh, load, uh, cognitive share to think about formatting the code. And autofix is great because you don't have to spend your time fixing these things. Autofix means you just run rough with uh, an option uh, fix and it fixes these issues for you. Not all of them, not all of them are automatically fixable, but a lot of them are. And my final thought about linters is don't lint formatting, okay? Uh, some of these tools like uh, Flake do have rules that tell you like uh, this line is too long. This operator should, should have spaces around it. There should be a line break. And these uh, rules you have to uh, correct by hand unless you use an auto formatter, but if you do use our formatter, why would you want uh, your linters tell you to do these, these things? That's just a visual cluster. You don't need that. All right. How do we enforce these things? How do we enforce using uh, auto formatters, linters, and so on? Uh, there are a few things. First, your editor or IDE it doesn't matter whether you use uh, Vim, VS Code, um, PyCharm, or anything else. If you use any decent editor, I mean anything better than Nano, it should <laughs> be able to run these linters and uh, run the auto formatter on safe, and I highly recommend it. You just set it up and forget about it forever. Uh, unless, like me, you work in a company that has different projects and some of them are auto formatted and some of them are not because of their maintainers. And uh, then you have to have a special hook uh, in the editor that actually recognizes uh, whether this particular project should be auto formatted or not. But it's still doable. I still recommend it. Uh, you can use precommit. Uh, it's in italics because uh, I have my objections to it, but I will cover it because lots of open source uh, projects do use it. Um, continuous integration is a great way to enforce anything because it runs on the server. And uh, finally, there's code review. Uh, which means someone else looks at your code and gives you comments. So let's go over these. Uh, sorry. Ah. So pre-commit. Uh, I actually ordered these in the uh, like closest to the programmer and furthest from the programmer. Yeah. So that. All right. Pre-commit. 
uh, pre-commit, uh, not the pre-commit hook, but the pre-commit project, is a project that creates uh, hooks in Git, uh, pre-commit hook mainly, but also other hooks, and it runs uh, different checks and uh, changes in your project. Uh, the good thing about this is that it can create virtual environments for these tools, and not only virtual environments in Python, but also in other languages, like their counterparts. Uh, the bad thing is it's not enforced on server, per se. Uh, it's something that you have at your own computer, and if you install the hooks, then before each commit or other action that you map the pre-commit to, it runs these checks, and if those checks fail, it won't allow you to do a commit, which is my main objection to it. I am happy to, argue, um, happy to uh, discuss it after the talk, but it's not the main thing. Uh, but it's not enforced on the server, so if the user or the programmer ignores it, it w he will still be able to push it, push the code to the server. It can be called as a part of continuous integration, and then it does serve its purpose properly. What's good about this is that you will get immediate, uh, immediate uh, response. You don't have to push the code to the CEI only for it to fail. You can immediately see there's something wrong with it. Yeah, there's just a simple configuration file uh, for this. Looks like this. It doesn't matter the exact form. You can find it in the documentation, but this is roughly how the configuration looks. Continuous integration is great. You can uh, run linters and formatters check in it. And uh, if you use GitHub, you have GitHub Actions. If you use GitLab, you have GitLab pipelines. Uh, and I think GitHub uh, slash Forgego also has something like that. Uh, and I guess most of you does use some kind of uh, environment like this. So you can run continuous integration and I would recommend it. Uh, this is simple because if the pipeline fails, well, then there's something wrong with the code and you should fix it until the pipeline passes. One way or another. Only then, well, yeah, sorry. Uh, if you don't use stocks, uh, I highly recommend it. It's a way to run your checks and uh, most importantly your tests in different environments, like with different versions of Python, different versions of dependencies, different versions of uh, Python implementations, and so on. So you just uh, say, I wanna do, uh, sorry, I wanna do rough check, I wanna do rough forma format check, because it doesn't met, uh, make sense to call rough format in the CI because it would change your code, but why would you want to change your code in the CI? This is just check. Uh, I also have MyPy here. Uh, static uh, type checkers are great, and I will do a talk about them, but the talk was too long. <laughs> so um, do pay attention to typing as well. All right, this is getting better, code review. Uh, how many of you does code review in your company or in your project? Great, that's a lot. I'm happy. Uh, for those of you, uh, for those of you who don't, uh, please start. <laughs> okay. So, why? Uh, what is code review? Real short. Code review means that you you create a code, uh, you you write a test for it hopefully, and then you submit it uh, and create a pull request on uh, GitHub or merge request on GitHub, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then someone comes and looks at your code uh, and he tells you, this might be better this way or are you sure about this or I don't understand this part, can you explain it? Uh, this is great from, from the cleanliness and tidiness perspective. This is great for things that can't be automated. As an example, for useless doc strings. You know, I uh, chose some. These are from our, our projects. And uh, yeah, I mean, everyone sees that if you have uh, def, uh, if we have a function that's called load list, that it probably returns a list. But what list? Return object list is useless doc string. It shouldn't be in the code. There should be a useful doc string instead. 
And that's something that you probably won't be able to discover using automated tools. Because it will check whether the doc string is there. It can check whether the doc string has a particular format, but it won't be able to detect whether it conveys useful information. Well, not yet anyway. We'll see what AI does with that. Uh, another great thing about CR is that uh, it helps with mentorship. If you have junior programmers, or if you are junior programmers, uh, and you want with some more experienced programmers, uh, CR code review is great for mentorship because you can learn uh, both ways. If a junior programmer does code review, he learns some advanced patterns. If the junior programmer is writing the code and the senior is making the code review, then uh, he can point out some beginner uh, mistakes that could be improved. And also, it improves bus factor. Uh, bus factor is uh, an imaginary metric that says how many people on your project can be run over by bus because it gets to problems. And uh, if you have bus factor one, then only if one person would go out, you would have a problem, serious problem. So if everyone, if every piece of code is seen at least by two people, it at least improves bus factor to two. And that's 200%. All right. Real quick, uh, some follow-up notes to all the things I said here. How to sync the project configuration. Let's say that you agree that you want to use rough and you want to use it with some set of rules, and now you want to synchronize that uh, set across many projects. And uh, let's say you are not using monorepo to make things uh, <laughs> more entertaining. You can use cookie, cookie cutter, which is thing for creating uh, projects from templates, but that only works for new projects. You can also use Ansible. Uh, okay, why would I say that? <laughs> because it's what we do. Uh, okay, so Ansible is orchestrating tool uh, written in Python that can make changes on servers, and that's what you should, should use it for. But you can also use it for pointing it to your own computer, like if you use the host, local host, and then it can do all kinds of changes, <laughs> like synchronizing uh, the configuration between projects. Uh, what I would recommend, actually, is writing a custom script. It's not hard, there's a great uh, library called Tomokit and it can uh, both read and write Python. Don't use templates, if you can, because uh, you usually have to edit PyProjectTomo, and PyProjectTomo uh, contains other information than just configuration for these tools, and you don't want to affect that part. So if you do use their custom script, just uh, write some wrapper functions that say, like, ensure that this settings has this value in this list or doesn't have this setting in this list. But otherwise, don't change the config. That's the way to go, I think. I'm happy to discuss it further outside. Uh, another thing, preserving git blame. Uh, if you introduce auto formatter, uh, especially auto formatters to your uh, code for the first time, it can create a lot of changes. And uh, if you use git blame, the git blame will become mostly useless after that because all the changes will start with this big refactoring. But you can avoid that because you can tell git blame to ignore some specific revision. And even better than that, you can create a file and put it to git, version it, that says these revisions should be ignored for git blame and then just uh, set it in the repository. Caveats. Okay, I said that this all can save time, and that, that's true, but it also takes some time. And uh, it can be hard to sell it to uh, your team leaders and management if they are not on the boat already. Uh, but the main argument is should be it eventually it will save more da time than it costs. Uh, agreeing on common style can be also very tricky. Um, one person, can decide what it will be. Well, presumably the team leader, it will be autocracy. Or everyone could vote about it. <laughs> That's horrible, it's called democracy. <laughs> and also, uh, what we do, we have kind of meritocracy system, which means only a few, well, only a few developers do agree. We can take votes, but it's not all the developers. Uh, and you can also have style meetings. Like if you are setting up a big new new changes, big changes in your uh, style conventions, then just meet either on Zoom or physically and 
and discuss it. Uh, keeping checks up to date can be tricky because uh, the tools evolve. New versions of RAF and other, uh, other tools are coming out and they can break your CI because they make changes. Uh, you can pin those tools, but then you can have to take care about updating them. Or you can just not pin them, you can uh, let their version grow, and then you have to fix the problems from time to time. That's what we do. And you can go over the top. If you, if you introduce too many rules, especially rules that don't have auto fix, you can find yourself spending too much time on it. So. Don't overdo it. If uh, you are new to this, just uh, select a, a reasonable amount of rules, maybe even default, and start with that. And you can build up from that. This is my recommended basic setup uh, that's uh, stored in PayProjectML for RAF. You don't have to use all of these. It's just for an inspiration. The slides will be online uh, or are already online, so you can find it in there. All right, uh, now we have time for some questions. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, if you have any questions, you can move to the microphone in the links and ask. Hi, um, why shouldn't I trust um, the formatters to do um, the reformat in the CI because what we are currently doing is uh, exactly what you propose. Uh, we just check it and uh, we are not able to merge into the main branch if uh, it fails. Uh, what the developer usually do is um, just say, oh, it's black again, um, goes back, it's um, black dot and um, commits it anyway without checking anything. So why shouldn't I do it in the CI? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't say it shouldn't do it, it's just not that trivial because to change the code you have to make a commit. I, I assume that you work with Git. So to change the code you have to make a commit and it's not very customary to create commits in the CI. But if you are willing to do that, you can do that. Okay, great, thank you. But, and then you also have to push it to the server. So you have to ha set up some uh, credentials and so on. And not that trivial, but it could be done, I think. Uh, yes, hello, thank you, great talk. Um, quick question, you mentioned that we shouldn't uh, do reformatting in the linter, which makes sense, but uh, do you have an easy way to do that for Flake 8, or do I still have to eliminate all the formatting rules one by one? Uh, well, uh, you usually have formatting groups, uh, so uh, uh, rules groups, sorry. So you can disable all the, well, all the groups of rules that concern formatting. If you want to use RAF, their defaults actually do exclude all these uh, rules by default because they assume that you would use auto formatter as well and don't want to intervene with that. If you uh, use Flake, you will have to disable them, but it's quite easy. It's like disabling three groups of rules. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Fortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but you can always ask Jan outside. Um, our next session will be in five minutes. Let's give Jan a round of applause.